get by It resides between my eyes Walk through the fire Came out better on the other side See life's like a peach If you find the same Like right now I feel like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. And I can't think of anyone, I mean, not many more people more inspirational than Andrew Warner, who I have today, uh, founder of Mixer. Let's G. say Warner. nobody. Not nobody, no. But uh, you are an inspiration to uh, many people. And um, I always like to, Andrew, point out a few episodes people should check out of uh, the podcast. And I like to choose ones that um, not many people have heard of but it's just a, an amazing story. And some of the, as you know, some of the interviews, I wanna hear from you, some of the interviews out there that maybe no one's heard of this person, but it's just an amazing story that everyone should listen to. So I'm gonna mention one, I want you to mention a few of Mixergy, but for me, Chris Ate Geka was one of the ones uh, on mine that was just really an inspiration. And just listen to the interview, he was seven years old, lost his parents who died of AIDS and he started two profits, two nonprofits and speaks nine languages, got a PhD at Berkeley, and uh, just an amazing story. So what's uh, one for you, Andrew, on Mixergy that maybe no one's heard of it, but just you, you think back on the story? I'm going to give two, one from yours and one from mine. You did an interview with Christopher Voss before he became like the cool guy to pay attention to. You know, the, the hostage negotiator turned author who's going to teach you how to negotiate in life. I remember reading that book and just saying, who else can I negotiate with? Well, I'm with T-Mobile. Let's call them up and negotiate. Hey, Olivia, you want to have a fight? Let's negotiate. I got these techniques. It was great though, because it's so practical. And then you had him on and you talked it through. It was, it was really good uh, because he's such a, he's an expert at his um, methodology, but he's also really good at teaching it. So anyway, that's the one on yours. And then for me on my podcast, I've really been enjoying playing chess on chess.com. And I just assumed Chess.com, it's a natural win. You buy chess.com, people have been playing chess forever. You put a chess game on there and the thing will just make buckets of money. And in fact, a lot of people thought that. I didn't realize how tough it was to make chess.com work. I didn't realize how, how much of a slog it was. But dude, that thing is making bank. It's just cranking out cash because crackheads like me are so addicted to chess and there's no better place to go play chess and then get your game analyzed afterwards in chess.com. So they're getting my monthly fee every month for God knows how long. Masterclass. What about Masterclass on Mixer G? What's uh, what's a fan favorite? Ooh, let me take a look right now. Um, so we we do do courses where I bring back entrepreneurs who've taught, um, who've done something especially well to teach it. I really like the one that we did with Cameron Harold. He is the guy who's really good at um, helping companies hire their second in command. And I remember interviewing him, saying okay, I should be interviewing you for my audience, but I need you for me. I'm trying to hire somebody for me. Help me think through how can I hire a COO? What? And it was such a good, helpful interview for me. I ended up hiring someone after that. I thought it was selfish. It turns out the audience loved it because other people were thinking the same thing. And my genuine questions were the exact same ones they were thinking about. Anyway, so he's an interviewee who then came back and said, let me teach you a little bit about PR because he's also gotten a name for himself. Who ever heard of COOs as a title? Nobody even cares about COOs. He made himself as like the best known COO in the business. And then also the guy who trains other COOs and he's built this reputation. Anyway, we invited him on. We said, teach us how you did this so that other people can raise their profiles in the same way. So Cameron Harold for interview and Cameron Harold for course. So many more. Check out Mixergy.com. And I have, I have a lot of favorites I've listened to throughout the years, but, um, you know, I like the ones on copywriting, direct response. I think it's the, the foundation for many things. And I probably a fan favorite. I don't know. Dane Maxwell was one of the first ones yeah. on copywriting, I think. So that was a popular one as well. It was. Yep. Um, Absolutely. So before I formally introduce Andrew, I figured we'd just jump right into it. Um, but this episode is brought to you by Rise25. At Rise25, we help businesses give to and connect to their Dream 100 relationships. And we do that, Andrew, by helping them run their podcast, of course, because for me, people have heard me say this, the number one thing in my life is relationships. I'm always looking at ways to give to my best relationships, profile them, the thought leadership, what they're working on, the people I admire, the companies I admire. And throughout over the past 10, over 10 years, um, I have found no better way to do that than have them on my podcast and give to them. Helping me now. 
thank you. I've got a book out. I reached out to you, said, yeah, let me help you. Of course. I mean, it's a no brainer, but we will talk about stop asking questions, stop asking questions.co uh, oh, where you can check the it dot out. com would have cost me an arm and a leg. I, I cheeked out. No, I couldn't get the dot Did you com approach whoever them? it was. Uh, um, you know what? Truthfully, it was listed on a service. I thought about getting it and I said, that's not what matters. I don't really ultimately need people to go to the website. They're going to go to the bookstore and then buy it. Buy it. If they need me, they can go to my website, andrewwarner.com or my company. Blah, 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 blah. That's it. The yeah. book, it should be in the bookstore. Yes. So you will check out, and I'll mention it in a second, but if you have questions about podcasting and you actually want to start one, I think you should hands down. And this book actually will help you with that um, it, with many other things, but you can go to rise25.com and learn more. And Andrew Warner, I consider him a close friend, a colleague, a mentor, all in one. He's founder of Mixergy, where he's interviewed over 2,000 entrepreneurs. He's the author of Stop Asking Questions. You can go to stopaskingquestions.co. It's a guide for interviewers and anyone who wants to learn more from the people they admire. He's a marathon runner who did a marathon on every continent in his 20s. You know, you can go to Mixergy on his about page, but use credit cards to create a 30 million plus a year business with his younger brother. So Andrew, thanks for joining me. Yeah, thanks for having me here. There's one thing I wanted to start with, with this book. Mm -hmm. and, and I was telling you before we hit record that I haven't read a book in, in years uh, because I listened on Audible, but I mm -hmm. did read this uh, because there was no Audible. But um, one thing I disagreed with, okay? And I was like trying to oh, think like of- it. Yes. What I disagreed with was almost the positioning of the book. There's so many other ways to use this book and the positioning of the book slightly bothers me. Okay. So it's stop asking questions, how to lead high impact interviews and learn anything from anyone. So I was like, it's so much broader than that there's so many more use cases and uses for it that when I was reading this, that's what I kept thinking. Okay. And, and maybe that's not, maybe that's the smart thing to do. You niche down. But so I wanted to start with that is the other situations people can actually use this for, because I don't want them to check out and be like, oh, I'm not doing a podcast or I'm not doing interviews. This isn't, this is worthless to me. I'm not going to get it. Yeah. Did you, you think know, about creating a broader, first of all, I want to hear, tell me about some of the uses, but did you think about creating a broader scope as a title? Yeah, it's true. I've been told from the beginning that all these interview techniques are actually applicable in all conversations and especially good with online conversations, which tend to be dull and then direct to business and there's no connection. And so I did for a while think I've been doing all my interviews remote. I'm getting into personal and business remote. Maybe that that's what the book should be. But I decided to, I wanted to focus on one thing. And then if we expand from there and other people appreciate it, great. So yeah, I, I, I've done so many interviews, I had yeah. tons of credibility in the space, mm -hmm. but absolutely the first set of books that were bought were bought by a company called People AI. It's software for salespeople. They bought it for their sales department. They bought dozens of them because they said, well, our salespeople need to have good conversations and good relationships with their clients. And you know, if they have good conversations with non-clients that could lead to clients. Let's buy them this book and help them use interview techniques to get that depth in conversations. And I, I think it would absolutely be used beyond interviews. Yeah. So what other use cases have you seen or heard? So sales? So sales for sure. I think what we're doing on Zoom a lot of times is, is getting right down to business instead of saying, how do I get to know the other person so they want to do business with me? I definitely have used this stuff when I've sold ads for my podcast. I'll give you an example. Generally, when people want to buy ads for the podcast, I, I've started making the calls myself to them and they immediately get into the numbers. Now, if they get immediately into the numbers, all I'm doing is putting myself into their spreadsheet and then they say, all right, Andrew has this many readers, this, this price, let's compare it to everything else. And then we'll pick the ones that have the, the cheapest price. I don't want to be the cheapest price. Frankly, I'm always the most expensive. And so how do I get them to get out of that mind frame? And so I thought the first thing I'm going to do is kind of what I do in my interviews. I make sure in my interviews, I say something personal about myself. It's not just about the guest. So before the conversation starts, I think what happened in my life right now that I could bring up. And it might be like one time I pick up the phone and I say, hey, Kathy, good to talk to you. But by the way, my kid just strutted out of the house like he is on the Packers, you know, like he's I don't, I don't know what he is. It's because he's now four and a half and this is a milestone. I can't believe it. I, we should all be that confident. 
Anyway, what's going on with your life? And now I said something personal about myself. It's weird for her to go, ah, not much. So what are the numbers? So she tells me something about herself. And now we know a little bit of something about each other. We have a little something to check in with. And then that allows us to transition to a sale. So in one case, I, I heard someone say, oh yeah, my kid is so proud because he was out um, on the beach the other day. I said, you know what? I got kites for my kid. I got to send you a kite. Gives me the address. I send him a pack of two kites from Amazon. These things fly up in the sky. Now we have a relationship that goes beyond, beyond business. So all of this stuff is natural when you think about the way we should be interacting, but it doesn't exist online because we've got the screen, we've got the agenda. And over 2000 interviews, I thought, how do I break through what the expected agenda is? And yeah. now I use it everywhere else. I wanted to rename the book um, something like Go Deeper how to use conversations and in interview sales or something like that, because you know, I go really... deeper was, was my, my title. Oh, and then somebody it? said, there's like some kind of romance novel that's go deeper. has got a double entendre. <laughs> I said, okay, I can't get it. But essentially that's what I was trying to do. That actually was at the top of the okay. guide for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's, that's what I thought. And one of my favorite parts of the book actually was, and I make this mistake all the time, by the mm -hmm. way. And I did it for many, and you actually just, laid it out there. I never really knew exactly what I was doing, but um, the biggest mistake I make, and it came where you had this conversation um, and the person left, the, left that conversation saying, oh, there's Andrew just drilling us again. Mm. Do you know what I'm talking about? I do. It was this woman who was in Toastmasters. I signed up because I want to learn how to give public presentations. This thing is a group that's been going on for, for decades. I get in there, it's helpful. And then they invite us all out for something social afterwards. And I'm sitting there with this woman and she, she says something like, uh, after my sister, uh, passed away. Suicide, yeah, come suicide, yeah. Yeah. She decided to drive to California where we met and everyone's like, wow, it's a long drive. <laughs> and, and they're just moving into like, that's really tough. And try, driving over here is, is difficult. And I said, she committed suicide and she starts telling me about her sister committing suicide. And I tell her about someone in my family who had, um, who had had an attempt followed by a lot of therapy and what that was like to our whole family. And she told me, actually, I didn't tell her that. I, that's what I would do today. That's, uh, I, that's what I did afterwards. I just let her keep talking about the person who committed suicide. And then I saw that she was happy. I saw that she got the release that comes from talking, but she felt upset because I milked her for her story about, about <laughs> her, her family. And she, and I get it. I didn't share anything about myself. What I did afterwards was then start talking about like my family member who'd, who'd had an attempt and that softened things up. I do find that it's really helpful to when somebody has what I call that is a dropped fact or shoved fact where they're shoving in a fact that it's like, they're, they're telling you how they got here, but they're shoving in the fact about the suicide. They're dying to talk about it. I think it's helpful to notice that and then bring it up and then ask follow-up questions and really let them talk about the thing they're dying to talk about. But what I discovered from that Toastmasters conversation was if I don't talk about myself, they're going to feel vulnerable. They're going to feel like I've just sucked all their information from them and it feels very one-sided. And so I've learned you got to put a little bit of yourself in there too. Yeah. I love this. And like, we've had many conversations over the years. So, you know, I feel like I've heard bits and pieces of this and this is put together, but that shove fact, you've, you've talked to me about that before in the past. And I always think about that because it's something personal. Someone will throw in there and you even talk about the book, you know, someone may mention a divorce or someone dying and they're mentioning it because part of them wants to talk about it. I remember you saying that. And now I pick up on that. Yeah. But but it's an uncomfortable thing. To yes, do. it is. It is. If somebody, if you're asking somebody, so how, how was your drive over here? And they say, you know what, because my sister committed suicide, I just decided I needed some space. And so I just drove and listened to music. It's really weird to go committed suicide, but you've got to, you have to, otherwise the conversation will lack meaning. It'll be about the superficial drive and they're begging for it. And once you do it once or twice, you don't even have to go deeper with it. You just say committed suicide or do you feel, oh, so here's another technique. I use what I call the, uh, what's called the double barreled question. I say, do you feel comfortable talking about your sister? Do you feel comfortable talking about her suicide? Is it inappropriate to talk about that now, the suicide that you just brought up? Two questions in one. Is it inappropriate to talk about? And then number one, 
uh, your sister's suicide. Now, what we found with double-barreled questions is people will pick the question that they want to answer and avoid the one that they don't. And so I've gone through my transcripts and I will see that people will say, I'd rather not talk about it. It is inappropriate to talk about. It does make me feel uncomfortable. And then we shift the conversation to something else. But almost always, by and large, mm -hmm. they will then jump into the thing that, um, that they brought up, the thing that I'm checking in with them and saying is inappropriate to talk about is a thing they really want to talk about. Yeah, because they could easily leave that out. I mean, they in the whole, leave it out. the whole conversation. Easily, easily. Yeah. Now, sometimes people slip because they're stressed about something that they shouldn't talk about in public. They bring it up. To at that point, you say, is it inappropriate to talk about you and your wife or what happened with you and your wife this morning? They'll say, I can't talk about it, right? They will absolutely say it if you give them space to do it. They won't even realize that they've picked up on the, your offering of saying no. I mean, I feel maybe even if they don't mean to, there's a subconscious, I mean, they're thinking about it as top of mind. They may want to yep. release it. Um, is there a time, I know, Andrew, it's happened to me where you leave, we've been in social situations together and you really dig deep with people and you'll yes. ask questions that are uncomfortable even. And, um, and sometimes I know it's coming. I'm like, oh, here we go. Like, this is going to be, this is going to be a good conversation and people actually appreciate it because it's not the surface level stuff. Do you remember a time where you were in a social situation with Olivia specifically? And maybe I'm not going to say she yelled at you afterwards, but she was like, why did you, why did you go there? Even though maybe people in the room were actually enjoying the conversation, but it is an uncomfortable thing when you're bringing up yeah. real stuff as opposed to just, right. you know, surface stuff. Was there Sometimes a time? you just want to have a cocktail. We don't want to find out how somebody is having marital problems and deal with it there. I'm very lucky yeah. that Olivia is and always has been open to this approach that I have in conversations. She appreciated it from our very first date where I was prying um, into her life. <laughs> Having said that, I yeah. do watch the room. You can tell when someone's uncomfortable. My point is not to go to a place where I'm giving one person a free therapy session and everyone else is in agony. My point is to watch everybody and get an environment that makes, makes us all get to know each other. And so if I'm looking at Olivia and I could see that she's uncomfortable, if the person is going into that personal spot, I can very quickly, easily drive myself out of that conversation and move us somewhere else. By and large, though, people want to have more meaningful conversations. We enjoy that stuff. We definitely do. So um, there's another favorite chapter. So we talked about the inappropriate questions a little bit. Um, and join the resistance is also one of my favorites. Um, and you use this many times in many different interviews. Um, I don't know what would be the best example. Um, I know which one you talk about in the book. The one I talk about in the book is the one that led me to understand it. It was, I did an interview with Jason Fried, the founder of Basecamp, massively successful project management software. You ask him what your revenue is. He goes, I don't care about revenue. I care about profits. I go, okay, what's the profits? Tens of millions of dollars a year in profits, right? Killer uh, author. I ask him, do you, do you have any failures? Because all I'm seeing is he is writing a book and the book becomes a, a super phenomenal success. He creates Basecamp, phenomenal success. He writes a blog. It becomes an industry guiding set of understandings that, that come out of the blog, right? He's the one who, who championed software as a service before most people would accept it, even in the tech space, because they used to be angry. What happens if you create software and people can't use it on an airplane? And go, well, eventually airplanes will get Wi-Fi, which they did. And also how many times are we on airplanes? Let's write software for them. Anyway, so he's that successful. I want to know a little bit of a setback to see how does he overcome adversity or to get a sense that he's a human being. And he says, Andrew, I don't think, I don't think we've had any, any failures here. I go, come on, everyone has. You know, Andrew, sometimes things just work out. Well, did anything not work out fully? Maybe it worked out, but not fully. You know, I don't think it's helpful to look back that way on, on our lives. And I go, oh, I feel now like such a, like there's something wrong with me for wanting to know that that failure and not being as confident as him and can ignore all failure in every aspect of my life. But there's also a part of me that felt like I was robbing both of us of a conversation that mattered. That was not, 
that was not about just the successes, but was about how he overcame the adversities to get where he was. Anyway, I hired the producer from inside the actor studio. I said for months, let's go over every single one of my transcripts after one of my interviews is done and let's find the spots that are weak and what I could do to improve them. And then one of them, I said, look at what's going on here with Jason. It happens with other guests too. What do we do? And he immediately said, Andrew, this is this thing that my therapist faced. So what do you mean? He goes, because the solution is join the resistance. I said, what? He says, therapist he says to me, my therapist used to have men show up and it was always men show up at her office. She would say, okay, let's go over what's going on in your life. That that's challenging. Let's bring you here. And the men would say, I have no challenges. And she would say, but you're here for a reason. You signed yourself up. Uh, that's my wife. She wanted me to see a therapist, but I think everything's good. But we're here now. Can we talk about a challenge? I don't have anything. And they just keep getting more and more clothes. And so instead of fighting their resistance and prodding and asking different questions, she decided to join the resistance, which meant if somebody said, I don't have any problems, instead of saying, we all do, she said, wow, it's so good to have somebody in here for whom everything is just working out perfectly. I, I obviously have people here all the time who are coming through and working their problems, but for you to be living the perfect life, it's got to feel great. And the person go, perfect life. Do you know my wife keeps complaining about how I, I am not doing enough? Do you know that the two of us just argued last night? Now, when you join their resistance, instead of like fight it, they will open up. And we all have that instinct. The more you push back on me, the more I push back on you. The more you let go, the easier it is for me to, to stop fighting you. Join the resistance. It helps in interviews. I went back to Jason Free, did another interview with him. This time, instead of saying, come on, we all have setbacks, I said, um, I said, you know, Jason, it's great that everything's worked out for you at base camp and the, your companies throughout. He said, actually, no, we, we had things that didn't work out. I said, like what? He said, well, we created this chat app called Campfire. It didn't work out. And we all know that um, Slack just blew up billion, multi-billion dollar company. He had a version of Slack before Slack came out. It was called Campfire. He said that didn't work out. But he said, you know, we don't invest every dollar of our, of our business in every new product. We give ourselves room to experiment. And no, it didn't grow great. We did have to sunset our chat app, but we didn't lose a lot of money either. And we were able to keep coming up with other ideas. And eventually what we did there, we, we learned from and we added to the chat app in Basecamp. And I thought that's such a healthy way of looking at things. Everyone else that I interview says, you have to burn the boats behind you. If you're investing, you got to go all in. He's saying, don't go all in so you can take a few shots. Anyway, I thought it was helpful all because I joined the resistance. We were able to get to that. So I have a new title, Andrew. So forget about go deeper, but because um, you know there's some whatever novel, racy novel with it, but so my uh, next pitch is open up, open up. Um, I like that too. It's, but um, is, is there another romance book called Open Up? Because go deeper. <laughs> there's no exaggeration. I see now three books here. One of them is about Menage a Trois. Right. Is this what you don't want to get confused with that no. one? But all right. The the um part of the the what you do when you help people open up is in in addition to joining the resistance, you also say the why, and that helps people to open up as well. Yeah, I think um, it, it came to me in the early days when I would ask somebody to do an interview and I couldn't tell them that I had a big audience and say, well, why am I going to do this? And I had to have a reason for them to do it. And my reason for them to do it would be, you know, I have an audience of entrepreneurs. They're trying to figure out how to build their businesses. It's not huge, but it's a tight knit group of people. I see them at my live events all the time. If we could just tell them what you did, they would be able to go and improve their businesses. And then they'll know you because I'm interviewing you here. You're in, in Southern California. They're in Southern California. They're going to get to know you better. And you're also going to have this story put on the internet for anyone who wants to come work at your company. Now they know the why, what the benefit is, and they're more likely to say yes. I think we just don't give a big enough reason. And so we allow the, the guest, we allow the other person to come up with their purpose. And, with, and if we can't deliver on their purpose, they can walk away. But we should bring them into our purpose, what our mission is, and have them then see how what they're going to do for us will get them further towards this mission that matters to us and to other people. Yeah, I like that too, because you can come at it from the why even of an audience member sometimes where you can be like, well, you know, someone who 
pretend like like in this situation, like someone t- pretend like you're talking to someone who has no audience. They have no audience. They've never done an interview. What would you do as far as that goes? It, it's that why of that audience yeah. member too. Yep. You're saying if, if somebody didn't have an audience, how could they <laughs> get a guest to come and do an interview with them? Yeah. It's just, yeah. I mean, it, it, it's like putting the perspective of that person and like, Andrew, someone's listening. I mean, it could be for any question, but someone listening right now, even the mistake for Jason Freed, right? It, it could be join the resistance, but it's also the why of Jason right now, someone is starting a SaaS company uh, yes. and they on are struggling. Person. And what would you, you know, what was the point? So bring it back to the why of someone else. Uh, you do that as well. Yeah. Um, someone else's mouth. Okay. I remember we, we had this conversation yeah. and this is, this is such a good one. And this is good. I think in relationships it's good in, in a lot of different scenarios. Yeah, there was, um, I want to understand how people ask tough questions without turning the other person off. Cause if you ask a tough question, sometimes people get angry. And even if they're still sitting there, they're not in the conversation with you. So I said, who asks really tough questions? Well, one says this reporter, Mike Wallace from 60 Minutes does. I, I said, you know, the thing that he's really known for asking is the Ayatollah, how he is insane. And I said, huh, how did he ask the Ayatollah if he's insane? Let's go back and find it. And the thing about the internet today is somebody's got a bootleg copy of everything out on the internet. There's a bootleg copy of Mike Wallace interviewing Ayatollah Khomeini on YouTube. It was available for like a day or so. Thankfully, I downloaded it. Uh, and then I uploaded it to us uh, to a transcript service, and I just read the transcript. And what I saw was he didn't say, "Hey, Ayatollah Khomeini, I came to your country after you kidnapped Americans and kept them hostage, and the whole world is angry with you, and now asked you, are you insane?" Instead, he said, Ay- "Ayatollah, President Sadat said his words, not mine. Forgive me." He says, "You're insane." And essentially, he's asking, what do you think about this other person calling you insane, not me calling you insane? And so I realized that's the way to ask a tough question, to not say, I think you're insane. Are you sane? Are you fully there? And then it becomes this confrontational thing. But instead, say, Ayatollah, this guy says you're insane. What would you say about that? And so in interviews, I've used that too. I wanted to ask Ryan Holiday, for example, why there weren't a lot of women on his uh app and product discovery platform called Product Hunt. If I ask him that, I know what it's like when people ask me, why don't you have enough women? I feel like they're accusing me of being racist or sexist or something, when in reality, I'm doing my best. And I could explain to you why it's not working out and what we've done and what help I could use. But once you start putting it in, like, you don't have enough women, I get frustrated. You could see it on Twitter. And I start to, um, I start to get angry instead of get, getting productive. So instead of asking him, why don't you have enough women on product hunt who are, who are creating products and getting featured? I said, how do I put it in someone else's mouth? And I went back and I saw that at some point early on in his site launch, he was asking for feedback. And this woman said, why aren't there enough women on the platform? And then he responded. I said, in my interview, Ryan, this woman in a comment said to you when you launched, why aren't there enough women What would you say to her today if she was looking at the platform and seeing that it's still not balanced? Now he had a thoughtful response about how he's working on it, what he's doing, and it's probably not enough, but at least we see what he's doing. At least we see his perspective and we don't get this this nothing but anger conversation. So whenever there's something you want to say that you're trying to get an answer to genuinely, not just piss off the other person, but genuinely get an answer. If you can't say it yourself and know that the other person is going to react calmly and let you talk about it, put in someone else's mouth. That is incredibly helpful. I'm wondering, Andrew, um, you know, one thing you taught me and gave advice on with interviewing or any conversation for that matter is just um, be curious, you know, be selfish and be curious because if you're curious about it, then people will know and experience your genuine interest and just be curious. So in this, when we were doing this, I was joking with a few people, it's like, okay, I'm interviewing um, someone who's in thousands of interviews about how to do interviews, okay? So um, no pressure there, which I don't feel because we're friends. But yep. um, what are some criticisms? You know, one of my um, 
the things I'm curious about are some criticisms that you get with Mixergy, either now or, you know, recently. Uh, one of the criticisms that I get is that we don't have enough women on the platform. And I think that makes sense. I'm trying and it's, uh, it's something that's important to me. There are clearly, if I'm interviewing entrepreneurs, there are clearly lots of successful female entrepreneurs. I don't know why we're not getting enough, but we need to put more effort into it. Um, the other one is not enough uh, people outside of the country. And so when I did a marathon on every continent, I also bought uh, the Zoom recorder, which is this device that all of the audio people I know say is the best quality device. I bought one of those. I bought some mics. I bought some earphones. I bought a whole setup and I took it to every continent and I interviewed entrepreneurs all over the world about how they, how they built successful companies outside of Silicon Valley. Um, another one is that I'm a little too rough with the guests that I'm not creating a warm, friendly environment. Instead, I'm just, what is rough pushing mean? And first question could be, what's your revenue? Second question could be very easily what happened to your wife who you started this company with who in the early websites, you said that everything <laughs> came from her, but when I, that's what I see when I go to internet archives. But now when I look at the about page, it's all about how you got the idea and you're the one who launched it. And I don't even see any reference to her when I do a, a Google search on your site for her name. So yeah, that's what, that's where they feel a little bit rough. What, any other rough question examples? Cause you uh, prep them for that, right? I mean, you even talk about that in the book, um, a little bit about, I, I forgot did. what the chapter was called, but it was something about how you can shock. Tip What's that? Tip them. Yeah, I do. I do tip them sometimes yeah. to what's coming up. I'm not looking to sandbag someone, but if I could say something like, it seems like your last four businesses just closed. And the one before those four actually had some kind of FTC uh, investigation. How, if we don't address all that, and then we let you talk about how your site is all about teaching people how to build a successful company. The audience is going to see through it and they're going to, anyone who knows you or does a Google search is going to think that we're trying to snow them and they're too smart to, to fall for it. We should just address the elephant in the room. If I put it like that, people almost always say, yes, absolutely. You should address it. I want to talk about what happened with the FTC and investigation and those last four companies. And I'll be super open and you can link it, right? Whatever it is. Some people will say, no, I don't want to talk about it. They're just not good guests. But if I say the audience is going to see it, it's weird if we don't bring it up. They're not going to trust a word we say if we pretend it doesn't exist when it's the biggest thing they're going to see when they Google your name. I think most people will be okay with that. And tipping them off like that allows me then to come in and go, dude, before we get into this new business, congratulations on how it's doing. You had an FTC investigation. They said that what you did was potentially a crime. What happened there? now? The audience just sees the fireworks. They don't know that it's not just coming from a, a place of, you know, gotcha journalism. It's coming from a place of wanting to talk about the facts. So you would say to those people, I'm prepping them for those tough questions. Yeah, I, I, I'd say I'm tipping them off. I'm letting them, them know, here's the big thing that's coming up. I don't always have to do that. I think sometimes people don't want me to, right? If you were to go to Gary Vaynerchuk, I had some harsh questions with him. I think before the interview, I said, Gary, do you want to know some of the tougher questions I've got for you? He doesn't want to know it. He wants to react in real time. Hmm. So fine. Those people, they love it. And I'm with them. Other people want to know where you're going, what's coming up. Do you, uh, what interview sticks out or two interviews about that people should check out on Mixergy that they can watch some of the tough questions? Whether personally or professionally. As soon as they join the email list, they're going to see um, there's, a, there's this company. I wanted to find out how they were doing really well with cutting boards in the shape of different states. So if you love Texas, you could get a cutting board in the shape of Texas, the land, the state. I asked the, the, one of the founders to come on. She said, sure. I asked her to book. She booked. She didn't show up. Did this? I don't remember the details of it, but it was like flake, 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 flake. You're committing and then not showing up. Finally, instead of her, her husband comes on. So we get ready to record. I go, okay, fine. I, I'm a big boy, right? They're, they're co-founders, co-creators, co-whatever. She wants him to do it. I want him to do it. Fine, let's do it. He gets on. All he gives me are these generic answers. I forget what they were, but along the lines of, 
You got to want it. You got to work hard. I go, can you tell me a time when you worked hard? Can you tell me how you worked hard? What do you mean by want it? Why do you want it? Yeah, you got to want it because you, otherwise you can't make it work. Do you understand you're giving me nothing but cliches? Instead of thinking, do you understand you're giving me nothing but cliches? I brought that up. I said, I can't have you just give me nothing but cliches. And I left it in. And I said, you and your wife told us that you were coming in. You didn't show up. She doesn't show up. So I called it out and I left it in the interview. I think a lot of people are trying to use interviews for nothing but self-promotion. And if that's what you're looking for, go look somewhere else. This is, this is not a self-promotion vehicle. I'm not here to be your PR puppet. But if you want to have a real conversation, I'm a great place to, to come. And yeah, I left it up. And it's one of the first things that you get as soon as you join my email list. You get to see that interview. Uh, that's the tagline of mixture. I'm not your PR puppet. Um, so right. blunders, you know, after doing thousands of this, people are probably like, you know, Andrew, you never make, you know, any mistakes anymore. You don't get nervous anymore. What's some blunders you may maybe made in the, even knowing this stuff, right? Um, we get caught up in a conversation uh, in the past year or two um, that you can remember on an interview. I had a situation with nervousness when I was in Estonia about to interview these entrepreneurs at um, an accelerator called Lift 99. And I, I don't know what it was about it. Maybe it's different country. Maybe it's that I was setting up in their office. Maybe it's how generous they were. Maybe it's the fact that they were robot. They had a freaking robot in there that brings food to your house from the restaurant or the grocery store. That that's what they're building over there. In addition to that, they created this like Uber for um, Africa and Eastern Europe. It's called Bolt. I got to meet the founder of that. The cre one of the creators of Skype was, anyway, before they all came in, I found myself feeling really nervous. And I, I, I couldn't believe it. I'd done over a thousand interviews by then and I was nervous. I don't know what it is. What I decided was I had to remember what got me over my nerves in the beginning. And what got me over my nerves in the beginning was the mission. Why am I there? I'm not there to look good. I'm not there. I mean, look at my hair. Look at the way I look. I'm not there to look good anywhere, right? I'm definitely not there to like be an Instagram star posing with all their robots. I'm there to understand how these businesses are built. Why, why them and not anyone else? And I just focused on that. And I was focused on the fact that I wanted to understand how businesses outside of San Francisco were built so that maybe my wife and I could leave San Francisco and both get to build a great company and get to have a great lifestyle. People, some of these people are going back to living on farms after starting these great companies. And so by focusing on why I'm there, I'm able to get rid of the nerves Always, always. Why am I there? So if you have advice for someone, you know, they're just starting out or maybe they've just been doing it for a little while. People, I've talked to people and you have too, they're, they're amazing uh, background, yet yeah. they still have a self-esteem thing. Like they feel like they're not worthy of having some of these maybe bigger guests. So you're telling them, think of your mission. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Think of your mission is a really helpful one. What's the thing that matters so much that you'll look like a fool? The other one is think of someone else. I interviewed early on before I knew that I needed to focus on tech startup entrepreneurs. I interviewed this guy, Yossi Ginsberg. He's like a motivational speaker because of this experience that he had in the rainforest um, in South America where he just got lost. He went out there by himself. He got lost. And then he had all these horrible things happen to him. A stick got like jammed in his body. He started to like see visions and he didn't know how to get out. And one of the things that stood out for me was the thing that allowed him to finally get his senses back was he imagined he saw a girl. And I said, a real girl there? He goes, no, no. I, I thought it was a real girl at the time who was lost. But she wasn't real. It was in my mind. I was starting to hallucinate because of my lack of food and the lack of sense of where I was. And he said, I started helping this little girl get out of this rainforest. And I started showing her how she could get out. And by showing her this made up person, I was able to get out. And I realized that a lot of people, when they get lost themselves, it's really hard to step out of their bodies and find the solution. But when, when they're helping someone else, they could do that. And so a good example of that is Emmett Shearer, who created Twitch. He, instead of focusing on the previous version of Twitch, which was just an anybody can 
go live stream with anything at a time when people didn't even have the resources and tools to go live stream. He said, let me just talk to a few people who are struggling to live stream. And he discovered that gamers had a real problem live streaming. They needed more than a webcam. They needed to show their screen. They needed to be able to talk over it and so on. They needed to find sponsors. And so he just talked to them and said, what are you looking for? What are your problems? How can I help you? And they had problems like they needed to know exactly who was listening at any moment of their live stream. He said, why does that matter? We're already showing you how many people are, are watching your live stream. He said, yeah, that's in the aggregate. But if I talk about my sponsor 20 minutes in, my sponsor doesn't want to know in the aggregate how many people listen. They want to know at 20 minutes in how many people heard their ad read. And so I said, oh, yeah, I could build that. And he started building that. By getting away from his own problem and focusing on how to help others with their problems, they were able to, to create this billion-dollar business, more than that, that now. Andrew, one of the things for me, and I love those, um, there's uh, a story, a time when um, I go back to, and I love the mission, thinking of other people. And it, I was doing a um, production call for Mixergy. Okay. I forgot who the person, it was someone very big. Mm -hmm. I don't remember who it was. And we were planning out the episode. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, maybe we're talking for 20 or 30 minutes. And then he's like, Jeremy, I'm sorry to interrupt. But when are we going to get the interview started? And I'm like, no, this is, this is not the interview. This is just the production you're going to be doing yeah. with Andrew. And I realized in that moment, and a lot of people know Mixergy. He didn't know Mixergy. He didn't know who you, he, he didn't know who you were. <laughs> he, he thought you were the interview. He thought, this is, yeah, you were the first real producer that we had on Mixergy guiding what the pro process would be like. And so, yeah, before then, we didn't even know that people wouldn't know what I looked like. or. So like, he's yeah. like, I realized, I'm like, no, I would explain. You're not doing it with me. You're going to be doing it. I realized in that moment, he has no idea who was doing the interview. Like, he didn't know me from Adam. He didn't know who was doing it. Yeah. I'm like, people don't know. They're just like, cool. Like, I'll come on. I'll be able to tell my story. And I think back to that because, you know, you are really well known in certain circles, in certain niches. Um, and I think back to that story. I'm like, he didn't know who anyone was, but he thought I was doing the interview in his so mind. What do you take away from that? Do you think that it's... Yeah, what do you, what's your big takeaway from that? Experience? We build it up in our mind that someone else is bigger, better, more well known. Ooh. And, and ultimately, the person has never heard of the site and did not know who you were. And so sometimes we think, oh, they built it up. They, they would do an interview with Andrew, they do an interview with so and so. You know what? I had a similar experience. I asked Seth Godin to do an interview with me but I didn't really have much of a reputation, nothing really outside of, Stamp outside of uh, Los Angeles. And so I went to Mashable and I said, can I interview Seth Godin about these topics for your site? And then of course I'll take the recording and put it on my own podcast feed. And they said, we'd love it. Seth Godin's hot. He's got a big following. They'll, they'll come over to the site. So I said to him, Seth, can I interview you for Mashable about all these topics? And also I'll put the recording on my site. And in the interview, I thought he wanted to do the interview just for Mashable. And as we were doing it, he, he I, I forget how it came out that this was going to also be on Mashable. And he goes, oh, this is going to be on Mashable? I know Pete Cashmore. Hi, Pete. He didn't even process that my request was to be on Mashable and, by the way, on mine. He just thought it was going to be on Andrew's podcast. Andrew's trying this new thing. Let's say yes to him. Let's give it a shot. And so you're right. We think people are going to say yes to the bigger people, and it turns out that's just not true. And it's really hard to, to not get that in your head, that, er, that other people are bigger, other people have more opportunities, but that's a poisonous thought. That is a smart way to do it, though, is borrowing credibility from other sites. And that, that's a smart, I love how you he, did that. Not enough he people do that. Today, yeah. they should do that. Back, today, they should absolutely do it. Anyone who wants to do um, a podcast, what they should do is if they can't get a big enough audience on their own, they should team up with someone else and do the podcast for them, but also get permission to keep it in their own feed. So for example, if I were going to do a podcast about software as a service, SaaS, I would go to someone who's selling to, to SaaS companies and say, can I do a podcast for you? Maybe bare metrics. All they do is keep track of data for um, 
SaaS companies of like churn and revenue and customer growth. Say, you don't have a podcast. I'll interview people. I can interview your own clients. It'll just be done beautifully for your feed. All I want is to be able to run it in my feed. And then at some point you can break away and I'll run it in your feed first and then eventually do it on my feed too. I mean, that's fine. Now you go to a guest and you say, this is going to be on the Bear Metrics podcast. They're doing it new. I'm recording for them and also to be on my feed. Now you're going to be able to get yeses so much more. Now you'll get people to promote it more. You'll get an audience. And then once you build up a little bit of your own archive, you could say, Bear Metrics, this thing is going well. You can take it and you can run with it. And I'll just do it on my, on my site. And frankly, hey. for some people, they could just keep it on the, on the partner site. They don't even need it on their own site. What do they need that for? And mentally that helped you reach out to Seth Godin or whoever, but yes. ultimately it didn't matter. Like he didn't, didn't even matter. hear that part, no. you know? So who are stretch guests for you right now? <laughs> so there's this assumption that for me, a stretch guest would be someone like Mark Cuban, but I, I don't find that they tell me anything that I can't read anywhere else. I, I just don't find that there's any great insight in them. For me, the big stretch guest is to say, what am I wrestling with right now? And how do I get somebody who's, who's done that? For me, it's a real sense of- Right now, it's who's bought a house in Austin. And <laughs> that's Ooh, who you need to have on. That would no. be a big one. Who's actually, who's bought any house anywhere and then turned it into more than a house? Like uh, there's one guest that I've interviewed in the past. I don't know if he's willing for me to talk about it publicly, bought 50 acres. He's going to turn it into a house and a compound where other people can you know, rent space and- have this whole uh, community. So yeah, whatever it is, it's more about what is my personal need. And I've, I'd urge every interviewer to stop trying to be the next Larry King. Larry King will be long forgotten. It's the people he highlighted that will be remembered. He's the guy who used to interview on CNN for anyone who doesn't know. I think you should just try to say, what am I trying to achieve? What am I trying to understand of myself? What, do I, what am I trying to get done in the world? Now I'm going to do interviews that will help me do that thing better. Mm. And by the way, now the research makes sense because you're trying to get to that anyway, to that topic. The interview will be more meaningful for you because you're trying to get there. And frankly, the audience wants to see somebody who's on a path trying to do something, follow along. And if they're trying to do it too, now they've got somebody who's an advocate who's asking the same questions they'd ask because that advocate is going through the same issue they are. So for me, it's what, what am I going through? What are you wrestling with? So- on that, who is a stretch guest for you with whatever you're wrestling with? Do you have a list of or things you're wrestling with or people you're reaching out to? One topic that is on my mind is I've been feeling a little burned out, not on interviews. I love doing the interviews. Everyone keeps thinking at some point I'll get burned out on talking to people, publishing interviews. I love it. I love having conversations that matter to me. But it's frankly the business side of the business. It's been rolling. I want to just take a break from it. Let it just keep rolling. I don't know how to, how to recover from burnout of that without wasting time, you know, where it's just self-indulgent, nothing happens and I need somebody to kick me in the ass. How do you recover from burnout in a productive way? And I know that burnout is a topic people have been talking about. So I'm going to find some people who actually have gone through it and can talk about it. Are there any experts that you found on this topic? I don't Who've think gone so through much it? that I would no. want experts as one person who I think has gone there is Gagan Biani. He, he raised tens of millions of dollars for Sprig after creating Udemy. Sprig just closed up. Um, failure. And he just disappeared. He went and traveled the world. And as he was traveling the world, I had a sense that he was learning something. And so he and I were chatting with each other on uh, text for, for that period. And that kind of informed my travels of running a marathon on every continent. I wanted to see what he got from that experience. I think he was someone who's good. Another person who's good for who's gone through it is Sahil Avinia. I feel like Sahil, and I'm going to interview him soon. He wanted to be the next Bill Gates. When he was a kid, he used to email me from school, tell me what his latest projects were. He was on Skype with me back when we were all using Skype and he would chat with me and tell me what's going on. And um, and then he disappeared and it's because Gumroad, his software to enable anyone to sell digital products easily, wasn't setting the world on fire. Couldn't raise the next round of funding. It wasn't going to be a billion dollar anything. And so he disappeared. And then I think he nearly became a Mormon. Maybe he did become a Mormon to give you a sense of like where he was going on that spiritual journey. 
he was painting and posting his paintings on Instagram. He just like completely checked out. Meanwhile, his business was still rolling, right? It's interesting. Once you get some of these businesses, they, they roll. And so for him, revenue was still growing, even though it wasn't jumping as much as he needed uh, to jump uh, for venture capitalists to be interested. VCs gave him back the equity that they had in his company. They said, here, we don't want it. Just give us a buck. We'll take it. But for me, what's interesting is what did he do in that period that allowed him to come back refreshed and not just, you know, go away and come back uh, discouraged. forced, discouraged. Yeah. So that's, that's uh, something I plan to ask him about when I interview him about his book. So last question, Andrew, I want to, again, point people to stop asking questions.co and you tell people this in the book, you don't want to end on a low point because then like, Jeremy, this is such a downer, like the interview could have been flawless, could be amazing. And if you end on this low point, that's what they take away from the entire experience, right? You know so I should have asked, there's a woman who's really well known in, in Silicon Valley that yelled at me after an interview and I didn't know why. It's because of that. The whole interview was such a gimme. Everything was, a. I was just tossing softball, softball, softball. She called me up as I leave the office, angry at me. Andrew, I'm disappointed in you. I've known you for years. I've been a premium member. I respect your work. I just don't know how you could ask me the types of things you asked me. I looked at, I don't even remember what the question was because it was such a wussy question. There was no teeth on it, but I do remember saying to her, now that you've built up all this rapport with me and I, and you trust me because you see that I'm a good person coming from a good, good place. I'm going to ask you the toughest question that I have. And I fired away and that's all she remembered. And that's why she was angry at me. And I learned my lesson. I know that at the end of the interview, people have the most rapport with me, but I also learned it at the end of the interview. At the end of any conversation, whatever you ask is what sticks with people and colors their experience to the whole end. You could have a great conversation with someone, give them just the toughest question at the end, and they think you're a tough guy. So no pressure. For yeah, this so. Uh, Let's end on a high point. You can ask me. You can ask me anything. You can even go on a low yeah, point, but go ahead. No, I want to um, just, as far as this goes, you f just the reason why. I mean, you don't have to write a book. You could have just done your thing. Right. So why did you decide to actually take the time to do this, which is a tremendous amount of time energy for you? You know what? This uh when COVID hit, I said I said I can't do Scotch Night anymore. We're just being asked by San Francisco to stay at home. I'll do my runs, I'll do my work, but I'm just gonna take it easy. And then this, and I'll also say yes to more things, just to take on some side things to keep me busy. And this guy, Robbie Abed emailed me and said, would you just write a chapter for my book? And usually I go, write a chapter for your book? What am I here? So I said, okay, Robbie, I'll do it. What's the book about? He said, it's about how introverts uh, can relate to the world. And so I wrote a great chapter based on my experience as an interviewer. And I sent it to him so proud that it was a lot of work, but I wanted to try new things. So I wrote a chapter and then he sends it back to me and he goes, nah, that's not good. That's not what I'm looking for. I go, Robbie, I just wrote the whole thing. And I think it's good. I've done these interviews. I know how to open people up and have great deep conversations. He goes, nah. And they said, here's what I think you should do instead. I said, all right, you know what? I'm going to listen to Robbie. Robbie's a great writer. So I rewrote the whole, I wrote a whole new chapter based on what he asked me for. And then I went back to him and he liked it. And I said, Robbie, I want to do more of this writing. It's been challenging, but I want to do more. And I said, I'm not someone who's worked well on his own. I need some help. I said, who do I talk to? And he introduced me essentially to someone who, who introduced me to uh, the, uh, an editor at Penguin Publishing. And I said to her, can you write with me every week? We'll just get together. We'll do screen share and write together. And she said, no, I'm not, I'm not doing that. I'm not babysitting as you write, but we could do something. And what we decided to do was once a week, she would check in on my writing and give me feedback. And initially we were talking about turning this into a book for anyone who wants to talk and build relationships via Zoom, kind of like how to win friends and influence people via Zoom. And then we realized the expertise that I have is through interviews. Let's focus on interviews. And it became this really challenging, but very satisfying process of saying what's worked for me over the years. Let's make sure to put that down in a way that's repeatable. You know, Andrew, one of the things is you're, you're always uh, looking to improve, improve the process. And early on, I think, I don't know, I don't remember you pushing back that much, but thank you for the acknowledgement in the book um, about apparently you did push back, but I thought it was important that we meet regularly to go over the process of improvement. Yeah. I, I hated that you would say that. You, I'd say the week went great. The interviews were good. You say, 
yeah, but let's go see what else we could improve. And I remember going, I don't have time for that. I can't do that. And, and you said, yeah, but it's not going to take that long. And you're so persistent and so nice about it that like at some point you realize, I just said yes to Jeremy to doing this. Okay. And then we'd start to go over the things that could have been better. And it became this framework for me of do analyze, improve, do analyze, improve. And it's become a real process of, of for anything that matters saying I've done it now, what could I, what did I do that could have been better? What did I do that sucked? And how do I improve? And that would go for anything, including scotch night. I'd have people back over to my office for scotch night. I would do it. And then I'd, the next day analyze and go, what could have been better? And I realized, you know what? I had somebody who came who's not into scotch, doesn't even drink alcohol, and I made them drink water. That doesn't seem like a good experience. It bothered me at the time. I want them to feel included. What could I do next time? Oh, yeah. The same place where I have my, my scotch delivered, they have non-alcoholic drinks that actually taste good and make you feel like an adult, not like a kid drinking uh, soda. Great. I'll add that to my list. Next time I buy that, now, now I have something that works for them. Oh, what happened after that? Oh, yeah. At the end, people felt like we were sticking around for too long. Great. If it goes for too long, people feel stale. I'm going to set an alarm so that I could end it and also go and have some time with Olivia at night. I set an alarm on my phone so that everyone could hear it, not my watch. And then after three hours, their alarm goes off and I say, oh, you know what? I promised my wife, which I did, that I'm going to go in and hang out with her tonight. Why don't we just go for a little bit longer and then we'll move on. So now there's a hard stop and the thing doesn't peter out and people don't have this you know, bad impression because the last few minutes were petered out. What do we do, ho-hum? All improve. Do analyze, improve. Do analyze, improve. That's the, that's the meaning of life. Do analyze, improve. Everyone check out stopaskingquestions.co. It's not just about interviewing. It's about having deeper conversations, about opening up and, and getting at a deeper level with people. So, Andrew, thank you so much. Thanks, thanks for being on, uh, for having me on. <laughs> thanks for helping with the promotion of this thing. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.